Uh, this is Michael Borenstein, and this is a short video about how to compute prediction intervals. For an explanation of prediction intervals, you might want to have a look at this paper, Basics of Meta-Analysis, I square is not an absolute measure of heterogeneity. It's published in Research Synthesis Methods. You should be able to find it online. If you have any trouble, send me an email, and I'll see that you get a copy. My email is biostat100 at gmail.com. In the paper, we have a link to a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, that you can use to actually compute prediction intervals. To locate that spreadsheet, uh, you can go to metaanalysis.com slash prediction, and you'll come to this page. Now, if you click over here, you can download the spreadsheet. And what I'm going to do over here right now is to give you a quick example of how to use it. I will use the example of the ADHD analysis which is one of the examples that we cite in the paper. This is a study of 17, this is a meta-analysis of 17 studies, and in every study, patients that were suffering from ADHD, that's Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, these were adults, they were randomly assigned to get either a placebo or methylphenidate. And the hope was that the patients that got methylphenidate would show an improvement on their cognitive scores um, were more of an improvement than the patients that were given a placebo. Now, normally in comprehensive meta-analysis, which is the program we're looking at over here, you would enter the mean and standard deviation for each of the groups. In this particular example, however, the paper did not provide the mean and standard deviation for each group. Rather, it provided the standardized mean difference, and so that's what we entered. So looking at the first study, for example, this is Adler, the mean, the standardized mean difference is 0.53, which tells us that in this study, patients that were given the drug scored on average about one half of a standard deviation higher than patients that were given the placebo, and the standard error is 0.14. To run the analysis, we simply click Run Analysis, and what we see over here is a row corresponding to every study, and over here we see a forest plot. To get a better sense of the dispersion, we can sort by the standardized difference in means, and we get a general sense of how the observed scores are dispersed. To get a sense of the summary, I'm going to come down here and click on random effects, and we see that the mean effect is 0.50 with a confidence interval of 0.36 to 0.65. Those exact numbers are shown over here. Now, all of these numbers deal only with the mean. They tell us that on average, across these different uh, populations, the mean effect size was around 0.50, and of course that's only an estimate. The confidence interval tells us that in the universe of studies from which these 17 studies were sampled, the actual mean effect probably falls someplace in the range from here to here, a relatively narrow range. But the key thing about the confidence interval is that it's a measure of precision, not a measure of dispersion. It tells us how accurately we're able to estimate the mean effect. It doesn't tell us anything about how the actual effect size varies from one population to the next, which of course is a very different thing. Now, if we want to get a sense of how the effect size varies from one population to the next, we're going to need a couple of uh, statistics that are presented on the following page. So I click where it says next table, and over here I have the statistics that I need. Uh, I'm going to click format increase decimals so I can see this with a little bit more accuracy. And the basic idea over here is that I'm going to need the number of studies, which is 17. I'm going to need the point estimate using random effect weights, which is 0 0.5058. I'm going to need the upper limit of the confidence interval for the mean, which is 0 0.6503. And I'm going to need TOS squared, which is 0 0.0387. Once I get those numbers, I'm going to open up the spreadsheet. Um, and the spreadsheet has four tabs on the bottom. There's one for means, one for ratios, one for correlations, and one for prevalence. I need to pick the one that matches the kind of data that I'm using in my analysis. In this case, I'm using a standardized mean difference, so I'm going to pick the one for means. And over here, I'm going to enter the four values that we saw a minute ago. 
number of studies is 17. The mean effect using random effect weights is 0.5058. The upper limit of the mean effect is 0 0.6503, and tor squared is 0387. As soon as I enter those numbers, pro the program gives me the prediction interval over here. It tells me that the prediction interval is 0 0.0580 until 0.9536. And what that means, coming back over here, is that what we're looking at over here is a sample of 17 um, studies. But what we're trying to do is to predict what the distribution of effects might look like if we had if we were able to look at the entire universe of studies in other words these studies were pulled from a certain universe that was defined by certain inclusion exclusion criteria we're trying to get a sense of what that universe looks like and what we're saying is that in that universe the mean effect is probably around 0.50 but the effect size in any given population might fall someplace in the range of 0.058 at the lower end up to 0.95 at the upper end. So there are going to be some populations where the effect is relatively trivial, some where it's moderate, and some where it's actually very, very substantial. The way that I might write this up would be something like this. Um, ADHD summary, the analysis is based on 17 studies that evaluated the effect of methylphenidate on cognitive function in adults with ADHD. In each study, patients were randomly assigned to either drug or placebo, and the researchers recorded their scores at the conclusion of treatment. The effect size is the standardized mean difference, D. The first question is, does, does methylphenidate affect cognitive scores? And for that, we look to the mean. The difference in means is 0.506, so on average, patients treated with the drug scored one half a standard deviation higher than those treated with placebo. These studies were sampled from a universe of possible studies defined by certain inclusion-exclusion rules as outlined in the full paper. The confidence interval for the difference, for the difference in means is 0.36 to 0.65, which tells, us, which tells us that the mean effect size in the universe of studies could fall anywhere in this range. This range does not include an effect size of zero, which tells us that the true effect size is probably not zero. So that deals with the mean. Skipping down here, we come to the next question, which is, does the effect size, does the effect size vary across studies? And I'm going to skip down to the bottom over here, where we say the prediction interval is 0.059 to 0.953. We would expect that 95% of all populations, the true effect size will fall somewhere in this range. So when we're thinking about the potential impact of methylphenidate, we need to think about not only the mean effect, but also the range of effects. Uh, basically, what we're saying over here is that the drug is probably helpful in all populations that are similar to these, but that in some populations, the effect is going to be relatively trivial, in some it's going to be more moderate, and in some it's going to be a very substantial effect. Given the wide range of effects, the next step might then be to try to figure out why it is that this drug is more effective in some populations than in others. Um, if you have any questions, please send me an email. That's uh, to biostat100 at gmail.com. So that's it for this module. Please take a moment to visit our websites, sign up at either one, and we'll send newsletters and information about our workshops. The website for our program is metaanalysis.com, and the website for our workshops is metaanalysisworkshops.com. And on that site, you can sign up here. This is Michael Borenstein, and thanks very much for your attention.